When I say Latin America in the Second World War, you most likely will think of one country and one country only. And that country is Argentina. But why? Is it because of the Nazi war criminals that fled to this country after World War II was over? Or was it that Argentina was to some degree a pro-access state? To what extent that is true is what you're gonna find out today. Good to have you back on the channel. If you're new, I'm Stefan, I'm a Dutch history teacher and I like to cover history on location. Like right now, I'm in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And if you find this content interesting, consider subscribing, hit that notification bell, leave a comment, leave a like, and you can support me via Patreon, PayPal, and via a super thanks. You can all find the information below the video. Argentina declared itself independent from Spain in 1816. And during the first half of the 19th century, it saw much economic and political instability. Economic improvements took place in the latter half of the 19th century. And it was also around that time huge waves of immigrants from Europe, most notably Italians and Germans, came to the country. Argentina was neutral during World War I. In 1930, a coup d'etat took place known as the September Revolution, in which the Nacionalista forces loyal to José Félix Uriburu overthrew the president. Uriburu banned political parties, suspended elections, as well as the constitution, and proposed that Argentina be reorganized along corporatist and fascist lines. And what followed was a 13-year period with repression, corruption, and fraudulent elections. And this was known as the infamous decade. Argentina's army was Germanophile and it was a tradition that dated back to the turn of the century and had to do with the many German migrants that came to the country and also served in the army. If you take a look at the uniform of the Argentine army in World War II, you almost see a Wehrmacht soldier. German military influence in Argentina dated back from 1899 because then the Argentine government wanted to modernize its forces and ask Germany for help. Germany at the time enjoyed a huge military prestige. German military mission to Argentina was initiated in 1899 where German officers came to Argentina to train staff officers of Argentina along the lines of the Prussian model. Now, the outbreak of World War I abruptly ended this cooperation. In 1930, German military fortunes were rejuvenated. Because between 1926 and 1930, German officers lost their power in Argentina. And that happened because they lost support from important people. It really depended how many Germans there were around and what the Argentine officers thought of the Germans. And before 1933, the German government had mixed feelings about their presence in Argentina. They didn't want their men to cause trouble over there, which made look Germany bad internationally. At the end, the German influence on the Argentine military wasn't that big. And sure, you can say the German World War II uniform looks very similar to the Argentine World War II uniform. Yeah, but that doesn't really say that the Germans had a lot of influence. Besides, black and white pictures make them look similar, but if you look at them in color, it is different. However, there were Argentine political and military leaders that were in favor of Nazi Germany and its policies. Argentina remained neutral when World War II broke out. It experienced an economic shock when the shipping lanes became cut off. And despite what people in the United States believed, Argentina did not march in lockstep with the Axis. Yes, there were political military leaders in Argentina that favored the Axis, which also had to do with the fact that many of them were of Italian or German background, but most of them were actually not. Many people of Italian and German background living in Argentina did not have sympathy for the Axis. Most Argentinians favored the Allied cause. There were even pro-Allied demonstrations in Buenos Aires. Argentina also delivered food to the Allies. Do notice that Argentina recovered pretty quick from the Great Depression. Already in 1935, their export levels were at pre-depression level. Now, when war broke out, there was another economic shock and the conservative government wanted to recover as soon as possible. And therefore, they aimed their eyes at the United States. Shipping lanes to Europe had become disrupted. Great Britain was seen as a power in decline and Germany was seen as too unstable. So therefore, trading with the United States had to make up 
for the economic losses. Argentine President Roberto Maria Artis, who was inaugurated in 1938 after fraudulent elections with backing of the conservatives, aimed to build a viable democracy as an antidote to authoritarianism. Ortiz was in favor of the Allies. Now, Jewish refugees, on the other hand, were barred entry from Argentina. And why was that? Several officers working at the Argentine Immigration Department did their best to bar Jews from entry. Some were pro-Nazi, others anti-Semitic, but that does not mean that Argentina was pro-Nazi, but rather that anti-Semitism, a weak record on Jewish refugees, and stronger pro-German sympathies in some sectors of the government than among the population at large could all coexist with a weak democratic government that tended toward the Allied cause in both its economic and strategic policies. The reason that some Argentinians were pro-Axis had little to do with German propaganda efforts. In the 1930s, conservative Catholicism made a resurgence. It was keen on social order and anti-Jewish. For members of the Argentine elite, this was appealing. Many army officers viewed the government of Ortiz as morally weak, a government that needed to be overturned. The Axis were not able to capitalize on some of the pro-Axis sentiments in Argentina. Once war began, trade between Argentina and Germany was disrupted and kept on declining as years progressed. German weapon deliveries in line with the arms purchasing contract of 1936 practically came to an end once war began. Germany asked Argentina to relax its neutrality rule so that German vassals, naval vassals could pass through Argentine waters but to no avail. As said before, Argentina wanted to strengthen its economic ties with the US. And because of the reasons mentioned before about some Argentinians being pro-Nazi and all, the US gravely mistrusted Argentina. Accusations were made that the country on a whole was pro-Axis instead of neutral. And this and the fact that Nazi war criminals found refuge in Argentina after the war makes people think that Argentina on a whole was pro-Axis. This was not the case. Argentine appeals to the US failed. See, Argentina wanted to become a business partner of the US, but the US had no interest. When the first Pan-American consultative meeting of foreign ministers took place in 1939, Argentina backed the US in a plan to adopt a 300-mile neutrality zone around the hemisphere. Later, a battle took place within the zone between British and German warships. Argentina then argued for a Pan-American declaration prohibiting belligerent ships from entering Latin American waters. Ortiz encouraged his foreign minister to advocate for non-belligerency instead of neutrality among the Pan-American republics, which suggested a last international response. This agitated Germany. This was also around May 1940, when Germany was launching its attack on the West and was making huge gains. The other Pan-American republics let the proposal die out. And with Germany's victory over Western Europe, Argentina's grain exports plummeted severely. Ortiz, ill and exhausted, left office in July 1940 and was succeeded by Vice President Ramon Castillo. He hardened his stance on the United States. Things radically changed after Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor at the end of 1941 and the official entry of the US in the war. The US now saw Nazis everywhere and also in Argentina. Many US diplomats believed that Argentina was a pro-Axis nation. Now to be frank, the Nazis did their attempts to win over the Argentine population. In the 1930s, Hitler sent his agents to influence German communities in Argentina with limited results. Between 1942 and 1944, Argentina became Germany's primary base for intelligence in the Americans. The name of Germany's operation for espionage in Latin America was called Operation Bolivar. But let me repeat it, most Argentinians were pro-allies. And that also had to do with the film industry. Hollywood films were very popular in Argentina and this caused North American cultural influences within the country. Argentine filmmakers were inspired by the Hollywood films, but because of US sanctions on Argentina, there was a lack of film material and thus the Argentine film industry grinded to a halt. Sadly though, because the Argentine film industry was the least pro-Nazi of all industries in Argentina, it was more pro-democracy. When US author Waldo Frank, who held pro-allied lectures in Argentina, was beat up severely, it caused international outcry and Argentina was accused of being pro-Nazi. The US put more and more pressure on Argentina to leave its neutral stance. On the 4th of June, 1943, Argentina's military seized power in a coup d'etat. What the US feared, 
that the new military junta would turn to the Axis, the new military government of Argentina turned to the US instead because they wanted weapons and a lot of weapons because the US was delivering weapons to neighboring Brazil and this worried the Argentine military leaders. Now the US demanded that Argentina would disrupt its relations with the Axis powers now. And the North American impatience led to a fallout in which the military government turned away from the US and wanted to create economic growth on its own terms by trading with neighboring countries. A group of Argentine nationalist officers that played an important role in this was the GOU, which was a group of nationalist officers. Civil unrest among Argentine workers and students was met with government violence. And for the US, this was once more proof that Argentina was fascist and pro-Axis. Argentines continued to see the Americans as those most determined to end Argentine neutrality, but the persistence of some popular anti-US sentiment had little to do with pro-German sympathies and everything to do with what was seen as a US threat to Argentine economic stability and growth. Till early 1944, the US kept cutting on exports to Argentina, shipping loads of weapons to Brazil and denouncing the Argentine government as fascist. The British were actually dismayed by the anti-Argentina stance of the US, notably due to the efforts of United Secretary of State Cordell Hull. The British were glad that the Argentinians shipped meat to Great Britain. Eventually, Argentina gave in early 1944 as the country was practically under an economic blockade and ruptured diplomatic relations with the Axis powers. During that time, Juan Perón rose through the ranks and was named War Minister in June 1944. He was a political pragmatist who stayed clear from pro-Axis and pro-Allied factions within the military. Perón stood out among his colleagues for his professional abilities and for his eclecticism of his political ideas. A stay in Europe in the years before the war had allowed him to witness the accomplishments of the Italian fascist regime, as well as to see the terrible results of the Spanish Civil War. Perón carried out social reforms, he extended the retirement system, paid vacations and accident insurance. Because Brazil was building up its military, Perón wanted to rearm the Argentine military. Early 1945, he openly spoke about economic cooperation with the US. With Hull stepping down, the US recognized a new Argentine government and the country was included as a founding member of the United Nations. The US now advocated a more pragmatic approach to Argentina, yet pro-Hull diplomats kept maintaining the image of Argentina as a pro-Axis nation an image that lingered for decades after the war. In March 1945, Argentina declared war on the Axis powers. Argentina did not send its troops to fight in the war, but around 4,000 pro-allied Argentinians fought in the ranks of the British. And there was Anglo-Argentine pilot Maureen Dunlop, able as a pin-up on the cover of Picture Post magazine. When the war ended, a German submarine made its way to Argentina, the U-977 under the command of Heinz Schäfer. It arrived in Argentina in August. The vessel and its crew were captured by Argentine authorities and its crew was sent as POWs to the United States. The voyage of the U-977 led to legends and conspiracy theories that this submarine had Adolf Hitler on board. Now Hitler most certainly died in Berlin. But what is true is that many Nazi war criminals made their way to South America after the war. This went via so-called red lines. I believe around 300 Nazi war criminals ended up in Argentina. One of them was Adolf Eichmann, who was one of the main architects of the Shoah. He was eventually discovered and captured in 1960 by the Israeli secret service and was brought to Israel to stand trial for his crimes. He was executed by hanging in 1962. His trial brought more attention to the horrors of the death camps of World War II. And then there was also Otto Skorzeny, who managed to make his way to Argentina and allegedly cooperated with later president Juan Perón. Now the story of the red lines is a topic for another video. And you know, I think most of you were actually surprised that Argentina was not as pro-Axis as expected. And to be honest, I was surprised as well when I researched this episode. 
And to be frank, the story of Argentina during World War II is actually quite boring if you ask me. So thanks for sitting through this episode. It is what it is if you want to learn about an exciting story of a country in South America during World War II, well, click here for my video about Peru in World War II. Oh, and I also made a video about the Dutch Antilles during the Second World War, click right here. Thank you so much for watching and best wishes from Buenos Aires, Argentina.